Hello and welcome to the Center for International Development's Road to GEM Climate and Development Series event. My name is Sara Bin Mahfouz, an MCMPA student here at the Kennedy School and a CID student ambassador. CID Road to GEM 23 Climate and Development Series precedes and helps launch CID's May 2023 Global Empowerment Meeting, Growing in a Green World. This spring, CID hosted a number of events leading to the GEM with the objective to elevate and learn from the countries on the front lines of climate crisis and will feature important learnings from the leaders who will be active participants at GEM 2023. Join us in person on the 10th and 11th of May. I very much look forward to today's discussion on mitigating the impacts of climate change on the right to education. Before we get started, I want to mention a few housekeeping items. The format for today's session is roughly a 30 to 35 minute presentation and around 20 minutes for Q&A. During the Q&A session, you will submit questions directly in the chat and I will ask them aloud. We're also recording today's session. A video of this event will be available on the CID YouTube channel. We will be hosting more Road to Gem events this semester along with our Friday speaker series. So make sure to subscribe to our communications and check our website frequently to learn more about programming that may be of interest to you. We will be sharing some links in the chat for you to sign up for our newsletter and social media channels. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker for today, my colleague and friend, Rola Momina, UNESCO's Right to Education Program Specialist and Lead. Rola holds a PhD in International Law from the University of Paris 2 and a Master's degree from the University of Paris 2 and Paris 5. She's currently leading the program on the Right to Education at UNESCO headquarters in Paris, she has been responsible for activities mainly related to the monitoring of the implementation of the right to education at international and national levels and development of legislative and policy frameworks in this area through technical support to countries, policy advice, and guidance. The work also includes capacity development and advocacy, as well as policy research on emerging areas in relation to the right to education. Rola, great to have you with us this Friday, and I'm aware it's almost 6 p.m. in Paris. We very much appreciate it. Thank you, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Uh, thank you for actually for this opportunity uh, to be here with you today uh, and, uh, and be able to present uh, uh, UNESCO's work uh, on the impact of climate displacement and the right to education in the context of our right to education program, which is part of UNESCO's uh, mandate. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I, I'm going to uh, present uh, an initiative that uh, was launched on the impact of climate displacement and climate change on the right to education uh, three years ago. Uh, but I will try to first explain in my introductory part of the presentation uh, what is uh, the right to education, uh, what are the main challenges and what uh, is UNESCO doing to, to ensure and, and implement uh, this right? So uh, first of all, um, I would like just to mention that, uh, and, and you probably all know that uh, the right to education was first enshrined internationally uh, in the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights, uh, which Article 26 clearly stipulates that everyone has uh, the right to education. Um, two, two years uh, after uh, the, the adoption of the Universal uh, Declaration, uh, UNESCO adopted a convention, which is actually uh, called the Convention Against Discrimination in Education, which is the first legally binding international instrument devoted entirely to the right to education. And by adopting this instrument, uh, UNESCO wanted to, to give shape to, to, to concretely um, guarantee the implementation of Article 6 of the Universal Declaration by uh, highlighting state obligations that uh, are aimed to ensure free and compulsory education but also promote equality of educational opportunities and prohibit all forms of discrimination. 
This convention was adopted uh, in, in uh, 1960. Today we have 109 state parties, which meaning, meaning concretely that we have 109 countries that ratified uh, the convention. Uh, so we are still uh, far uh, from universal ratification, this major convention. We have also, and you know, I'm sure uh, most of them, uh, in addition to this convention, with, which is entirely dedicated to, to, the right, to the right to education, we have also international major treaties that guarantee various aspects of the right to education. We have, for instance, the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which complements uh, the UNESCO Convention, but we have also some treaties that uh, target uh, specific uh, groups and complement uh, in terms of legal obligations and legal guarantees. So what uh, concretely uh, this right to education include, the right to education as was developed by international instruments. So it, it guarantees primary education that should be free and compulsory and universal, but also secondary education, higher education, and this is very often less known, higher education is also part of the right to education and the legal obligation that is that are contained in the right to education. It also includes that higher education is uh, meant to be progressively free and, and uh, accessible on the basis of individual capacity. But we have also fundamental education and lifelong learning opportunities. Uh, we have also the learning environment, uh, which is guaranteed by the right to education. Uh, the training opportunities for teaching profession, but also working conditions, materials, and status. Also, the quality of education with the minimum standards uh, that needs to be imposed. And also, of course, uh, rolling out of discrimination at all levels of education systems and the guarantee of the freedom of choice. Uh, we have, oh, I mean, the right to education. Uh, imposes uh, concrete obligations on the duty bearers. And these are legal obligations that are meant to ensure domestic implementation. And we have what we call the tripartite typology, which relates to human rights. And we have here three types of obligation on states. They have to respect the right to education, which means avoid taking measures that hinder or prevent its enjoyment. We have to protect as well, which means taking concrete measures that prevent third parties from interfering with it. And they have to fulfill, uh, concretely taking positive measures to, to, to enable and assist individuals and communities to, to enjoy the right to education. And this include, includes two obligations, two sub-obligations, which are facilitating its realization but also providing for its, uh, for its implementation. Uh, this is uh, what we call the four A's framework for the right to education. Uh, the four A's meaning concretely education has to be available. So statements ensure that education uh, at all level is, is, is available in sufficient quantity. It has to be acceptable and this is very much linked to quality. Uh, it has to be accessible, and education needs also to be adaptable. Um, this is the four A's, but I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, we have been, um, I mean, uh, th there is an, 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 a tendency uh, uh, to add a fifth A, which is becoming more and more important when it comes to uh, education and the implementation of the right to education, which is a fifth A, accountability. It's not part of the official uh, framework, uh, the four A's framework. So we don't, we still have not a five A's framework, but uh, there is a clear uh, trend uh, toward, uh, towards adding the, this uh, fifth A, which is accountability to this um, established uh, framework. Uh, so uh, the right to education, we. Today, we see uh, um, progress in, in its implementation, uh, that's for sure. 
uh, we have, for instance, 62% uh, percent of countries which guarantee the right to education without discrimination in their constitution or law. We have 71% percent of countries which fully guarantee uh, nine uh, years or more of compulsory primary and secondary education. And of course, uh, uh, for the last 20, 20 years, we, we see that uh, the number of out of school children and adolescents uh, drop. Uh, we have improvement in, in gender equality and there are also uh, important efforts that are deployed to assess if learning outcomes have been achieved. But uh, despite this progress, we still have many, many challenges, of course, and that, of course, you know, Uh, we have approximately uh, 245 million children and adolescents who still do not go to school. Uh, we have only uh, 33% percent of countries uh, who fully guarantee at least 12 years of free primary and secondary education in their legislation. And there are uh, millions and millions of illiterate adults uh, worldwide. And of course, discriminatory uh, practices uh, remain. And we have uh, spe specific challenges faced by vulnerable groups. We have, uh, unfortunately, non-exhaustive list of, of vulnerable groups uh, that, uh, that are facing uh, challenges and uh, in, in, in enjoyment of the right to education. So there is clear need for equality of opportunities and inclusion in education. So we clearly need to implement what has been developed in legal normative instruments that uh, countries um, uh, subscribe to. I just like to mention to take this opportunity to say, even if we don't have universal um, ratification on the UNESCO Convention Against Discrimination in Education, as I explained earlier, we have a framework at international level Uh, composed of different treaties, and all the countries have ratified at least one of, 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 of these uh, treaties. So all of them are supposed to implement the right to education. Very quickly, just to mention that uh, UNESCO um, has the mandate to work on the right to education. UNESCO also is mandated to lead the Education 2030 Agenda, Um, uh, particularly Sustainable Development uh, Goal 4, uh, which is a rights-based uh, agenda. And uh, to respond to these challenges, uh, we have been developing, monitoring, and promoting education norms and standards to guarantee the, the right to education. And uh, we specifically work to ensure uh, states' legal obligations are reflected in national frameworks and translated into concrete policies and policy and programs. We do this through technical assistance and, and also support. We also try to build and develop capacities. We also do it through the monitoring of the implementation uh, of the right to education at country level. And we also uh, promote and advocate for this right uh, through a uh, awareness raising and communication work, but also through research and studies. And as part of this third uh, area of, interven of, of intervention, we uh, developed um, three years ago, we launched, sorry, three years ago, uh, 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 an initiative um, because, uh, because Persons who are displaced by the effects of, of, of climate change uh, face really significant barriers to, to, to education. Uh, we, we know today that we have more than uh, um, 23 million people who, who were displaced uh, in 2021 alone as a result of natural and climate, climatic disasters. So, The barriers to education faced by this climate displaced pe uh, persons are affecting a larger portion of the global population each year. So this is important. This is important. The right to education, as was, I was explaining, is the right to education for all. Uh, of course, it includes all includes refugees, but the category of refugee, I mean, refugees is is a um, are as a, as a, a group that uh, has uh, 
concrete uh, rights guaranteed in international law. But um, people who are displaced by the effect of, of climate change have specific uh, and are facing specific barriers. And some of them uh, is concretely schooling its infrastructures, which is destroyed. Very often we have, uh, they, are, they are facing language uh, barriers. And also there is a higher risk of dropout to pursue economic activity and exacerbating poverty. And uh, sometimes lack of uh, legal residency rights um, uh, also uh, is a result of, of climate change. So, so the, the challenge is, is clear because um, yet the political discourse surrounding education and climate change remained focused on climate migrant um, uh, as a problem for distant future, while we know that it's not it's for, it's for today. Uh, uh, migratory and residency rights also, as opposed to the fulfillment of right to education for a displaced person. And, um, and also focus, the discourse was focusing on the prevention of climate change it, which, through education for sustainable development and, and uh, climate change inclusion in, 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 international, in, um, in, in the uh, national educational curriculum, but not on ensuring access to education for those people who are already displaced by the, by the consequences of, of, of climate change itself. So this is, uh, 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 why we, we, we launched uh, this initiative. I'm not going to get into, into detail because I think I don't have time for that. But uh, just to mention that uh, there are some, uh, di there are different differences. Um, uh, of course, I mean, as I, I was mentioning, uh, of course, some might claim that ensuring the right to education for climate uh, displaced uh, persons can be achieved within the existing framework of a, of a right to education. But uh, this is not true because climate displaced per, uh, persons face certain unique barriers to education. And therefore they require a specific and tailored responses in terms of legal framework. Uh, we know refugees are guaranteed uh, residence, uh, residency rights uh, as well right to education under international law. Climate displaced persons do not uh, legally qualify as refugees and therefore they, ha they have no uh, such rights uh, protected. And in terms of, uh, of policy angle as well, migrants and conflict displaced persons uh, are populations widely recognized and visible by governments, international organizations, as uh, as vulnerable groups, uh, so the right to education can be, and it's not not always the case, but can be see, uh, seen as a priority. Climate displaced uh, persons remain a population still invisible without any formal recognition in national policies. And if uh, a population uh, remains invisible, national policies will remain unable to address uh, the right to education. There are also practical uh, consideration. Uh, 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 the length, the length of, of displacement, uh, for instance, um, climate displaced persons are often displaced only temporarily following sudden onset events. And due to the temporary nature of, of displacement, little emphasis is put on, on, on temporary educational fac facilities have also the infrastructural damage uh, uh, and, and, and shelter. Uh, so schools are all, almost always the infrastructure used as shelter, which render impossible the ability to continue education in terms of emergencies. Uh, we have uh, also uh, the cyclic asset loss and poverty. And, and climate displacement repeatedly experience uh, climate driven loss and uh, of livelihood and, and destruction of all assets. So uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, trusting them very often, necessarily, uh, necessarily systematically, but very often into uh, poverty without means, uh, means to, to pay for schooling, uh, leading uh, to, to drop out, of course. And there is also this, the, uh, the specific aspect of uh, 
planned uh, relocation as well, uh, which actually, uh, I mean, this, uh, this uh, um, planned uh, relocation warrants extreme attention on the part of authorities, uh, but also gives uh, a unique uh, opportunity to ensure both access to education and uh, access to livelihoods in, in the, of course, relocation destinations. Uh, so what's the, the rationale, very quickly, I try to, to be, uh, try to accelerate a bit, sorry for that. So what's the, the rationale uh, for, for, for this initiative? So to, to address uh, these challenges that I was uh, trying to, to explain uh, and, and gap in, in discourse as well, we have been asking this question, how can state ensure the right to education for climate displaced person considering the impacts of heightened human mobility? Uh, so we introduced uh, this thematic area dedicated to the effect of climate uh, displacement on the right to education, building on previous work. So this project, which is co called the impacts of climate displacement on the right to education, uh, was launched to improve and, and has the objective to improve the preparedness of states to ensure the inclusion of all climate displaced persons in quality education in national systems through uh, developing policy guidance. Uh, it is a three steps uh, process, three step process, sorry. Uh, so we we uh, we started this initiative with uh, the publication of a policy paper uh, that was released in um, December 2020, uh, which includes a literature review and provides a general uh, policy uh, guidance. And this was followed by. Um, um, by uh, the development of uh, country case studies um, in four different regions, in four sub-regions, Asia Pacific, uh, Latin America and Caribbean, uh, Southern uh, Europe and Eastern Africa. Uh, so based on, uh, on individual, on, on country case studies, um, uh, uh, we have, developed a synthesis regional report, uh, which will be, uh, and I will, I will come back to that uh, later on, uh, this, uh, I mean, very shortly. And the, three, th the third step is the development of a global uh, synthesis uh, report, um, analyzing the trends, but also the convergences and the divergences in the results, uh, in the results of the res uh, regional uh, research and uh, will uh, be uh, presenting uh, um, tailored policy recommendations and, and, and guidance uh, for policymakers. Um, so now we are finalizing uh, the uh, regional uh, reports that are based on the country uh, case studies. Uh, they will be, I mean, three of them will be hopefully um, uh, published on the occasion of the International Earth Day uh, next next month, so very soon. Um, so just to mention that the the purpose of these regional studies was, uh, it, I mean, is based on the initial uh, policy paper that was developed to uh, gather em empirical data on the barriers to education in these regions. Uh, to fill uh, the uh, the data gap in, in in the existing literature, but also to identify patterns of climate displacement and specific barriers in in the different regional context, and as I already mentioned, it uh, develop tailored uh, tailored sorry tailored operational uh, policy recommendations uh, for the different uh, displacement scenarios in each region. So. The final step will be the, to, to produce a global synthesis report um, in containing uh, practical guidance that all states and not only those uh, which were uh, examined uh, in the context of the, uh, of the regional research, all states can, uh, can use 
um, uh, as they attempt to accommodate uh, uh, displaced uh, person. So this global report uh, is, um, is expected to be uh, published by end of uh, this year and um, hopefully launched uh, during the COP28. Um, just to, yeah, okay. It's also just to mention that, uh, of course, we are involving uh, international uh, experts uh, and we are conducting consultations in, in the finalization of, uh, of this, uh, this product. Um, re regarding the preliminary findings, um, um, I would just uh, mention uh, that uh, we have some specific findings uh, in, in the different uh, regions. Uh, for instance, in Asia Pacific uh, region, uh, actually it is the region that is most affected by disasters, uh, disasters and, and, and of course climate, uh, climate displacement. We have displaced families struggling to enroll children, uh, their children in, in new schools. Uh, in Latin America, we know that uh, they are uh, <laughs> uh, the subregion is, is highly affected uh, and schools are destroyed. Uh, poverty prevents enrollment uh, in education and students, of course, uh, as a consequence, drop out. Uh, Eastern Africa, um, we know that majority of the population employed in, in agriculture and road of, of course, drought leads to, to, to poverty. Um, we have, uh, of course, a resource competition, which, which often leads to, to, and to, to, to conflict. Um, so the, the origin of the problem is, is the uh, climate change, uh, which is not necessarily acknowledged. Uh, and also we have farmers uh, who move to urban slums for work and, uh, and whose children struggle to access education. Uh, we have also the specific, uh, specific issues in, in Southern uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, we have uh, a large number of course of, of persons who are already displaced. Uh, we have hundreds hundreds of thousands of displaced who are newly displaced. So the, the phenomenon is, is important. Uh, we have limited capacity to adapt to economic impacts of disaster. And uh, we have um, uh, schools uh, which are destroyed and limited capacity for, for mobility uh, as non-members of the uh, European Union. So we have also, I mean, uh, Beyond this, this specific, uh, the, the specific um, uh, uh, challenges, we have the, some common trends uh, across the different regions uh, uh, as a result of the of the research. And I will maybe just very very quickly summarize them in this uh, in this uh, few few uh, items. So we have. We, we noticed that uh, schools are often used as emergency shelters, and that's of course prevents uh, the continuation of, of education. Uh, as climate uh, destroys livelihood, much of economic migration is actually a climate driven displacement. And this is one of, of the findings of, of the research across uh, different regions as well. Uh, of course, and this is something that we can easily uh, understand, children displaced to new regions face language barriers, uh, even sometimes uh, in, in the same country, uh, administrative discrimination and, and trauma. We have families displaced to urban slums are left with minimal uh, educational opportunities. Of course, as climate disasters lead to more poverty, this lead to even uh, more barriers to education. This is a normal uh, consequence. Uh, we notice that policies uh, are not uh, systematically cross-cutting and disaster risk reduction does not include education uh, and vice versa, I would say, education does not systematically account for displacement. And this is uh, also a problem uh, 
uh, that also needs to be to be addressed uh, to have a comprehensive uh, response. Uh, climate directly destroys schools. I mean, schooling infrastructures and materials. So there is a direct consequence. And uh, all, and finally, almost no states monitor climate displacement. Uh, uh, their the right to education cannot be ensured until, of course, and as I was explaining earlier, climate uh, displaced uh, persons become uh, visible. So data is is, is important uh, in this context. So. There is need for engagement and we need uh, impact. So as we are finalizing the global uh, policy uh, guidance, uh, states must, must show a political will to collaborate and implement uh, changes. Also the educational community must engage uh, within env in environmental risk reduction and emergency authorities to find cross-cutting and comprehensive uh, solutions. And international community should strive uh, for public-private partnership to increase uh, funding, but also awareness, engagement, and, and implementation. It's important to make sure that climate displaced per persons cannot uh, remain invisible. I just, I, maybe just to, 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 to finish my presentation, um, to mention that we have, uh, UNESCO has launched uh, an initiative um, two, two years ago. It's an initiative uh, that um, examine um, the evolving dimensions of the right to education. Uh, so this, through this um, uh, initiative, UNESCO ex explores how this right to education that I was uh, explaining and describing earlier uh, at the beginning of my presentation could be uh, further um, reinforced uh, how this international legal framework that, that uh, guarantees the right to education could be uh, further uh, reinforced in light of the new uh, challenges, uh, new to today's uh, realities. Uh, we have the persistent uh, challenges, but we have today new challenges. And uh, this issue is, uh, is, a new, is a new challenge. It's, it's considered also as a new challenge, of course. So this uh, initiative is a consultative process that has been informed by um, the Future of Education Initiative and also um, all the monitoring work. So it investigates uh, different areas, different themes, uh, lifelong learning entitlements. We, today we consider that uh, uh, the, the right to education is um, it goes beyond formal schooling. It's the, the right to education that extends throughout life and that take, can takes place in, in, in different settings, in different spaces, at different ages. So what could be today concretely the rights, the entitlements in terms of lifelong learn, learning? Another area is the right to inclusive education. Uh, the specific protection uh, developed for, for vulnerable groups and, and climate displaced uh, person are among this uh, most vulnerable groups. So there is need to um, develop specific uh, legal obligations and specific rights in the international legal framework to ensure the right to education and to ensure that uh, the systems, educa education, systems at national levels are prepared uh, to, to, uh, to, 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 ensure, to, uh, to include them and ensure the right to education. We have also the evolving role of teachers. Uh, we have the government structures and financing that are important also to, 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 to ensure uh, a, a, um, regulation at international uh, level. Um, we have the human rights education and the climate change uh, education consideration, the digital transformation, of course, but also the involvement of, of non-state, uh, the growing involvement uh, of non-state actors in education. So uh, I think that's it. Um, uh, I, I, can, I can share with you, I mean, I, I, we have, I have 
uh, added the link uh, to this uh, specific uh, initiative on the evolving right to education, also the link to uh, the uh, initiative on climate uh, displace displacement. So uh, I and I would be happy to to respond to any question or remark or comments you would like to, 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 to share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rola, for giving us some background information on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, on the right to education, sharing UNESCO's mandate on the right to education, and for sharing important findings of the study with us. Lots of efforts are still needed, of course, to mitigate these challenges, and your presentation highlights the significance of conducting research to inform better policy recommendations that can mitigate the impact of climate change. And now let's open the floor to the Q&A. I see three questions uh, in the q and I'll start with the first one from my classmate, Vila P. Mamba. Uh, thank you, Rola, for such an important presentation and the great work being done. Two questions. One, given the cynical nature of climate impacts, as you have mentioned, what are the pragmatic resources, finances, implications for sustainability addressing challenges faced by climate change displaced persons? Um, over to you, Rola. Maybe you can have the, all the questions and I, then I will respond. Yeah. Uh, the, second, the second question uh, from Fatima Sumar, the executive director of the Center for International Development. Given the crisis regarding climate and impacts on education, what steps does the international community need to take to prioritize these steps? And the third question um, is, is this initial research and analytical work integrating questions of inclusion, especially for the most vulnerable population who often experience impacts in more acute ways than other groups? These are the questions, and I know the speakers are online, so um, they're happy to elaborate um, on the questions asked. Do you want them to elaborate or uh, sure. as, you, as you wish? Uh, as you wish. I know we have uh, 20 more minutes, so up to you. We can start and then maybe they can have their follow up questions. Yes, sure, sure. No, just to, to mention that, and thank you very much for all this, uh, these questions. Not just to mention that, all, I mean, this, this, all this research work is about inclusion, actually. It's about ensuring inclusion and right to education of this uh, category of vulnerable groups and we, which, who are experiencing even more vulnerability, no? So, uh, so this, um, this is, the, the, I mean, the main um, purpose of, of, this, uh, of this activity, to ensure the right to education and inclusion of climate displaced person and ensure their integration in, um, in, the, education, in the education and national systems. No? Uh, so there are one, one of the main um, important aspects that, uh, that we think is, uh, I mean, yeah, there are two, but, uh, First, of course, collecting data. I mean, no, knowing who these persons are. Huh? So this is an important, and this is something that we noticed uh, uh, coming from uh, the uh, the investigation in the different region. But another one, which is uh, important, is that uh, they are not necessarily recognized, and they don't have concrete guarantees in the national legislation. And this is the first step. No, this is the, 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 the to ensure to ensure that they have specific uh, uh, they have specific rights and guarantees in the in the in the national legislations, and that policies acknowledge and 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 they are visible in national policies, and then uh, they we can uh, they can uh, uh, be. Uh, uh, integrated uh, and 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 and, uh, but the, the problem is is more complex than that, no? Uh, because we see that we are okay. We are referring to climate displaced person, but they are not necessarily displaced person. They are people who are affected by climate change, and not necessarily uh, uh, in a scenario of displacement. So this is uh, an exacerbation of poverty. Is uh, is really. Uh, uh, a major challenge. So, of course, 
uh, having an international framework that um, defines specifically uh, their, their rights, that guarantees uh, and, and provides uh, um, guidance for regulations by, by countries is not sufficient, of course. This, is not, uh, this will not uh, uh, address the problem, but it's a way also to encourage uh, uh, countries to, and policymakers to, um, to take this aspect into consideration and, 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 uh, and start uh, uh, and also uh, see how we can uh, uh, leverage international platforms and uh, see how we, uh, this, uh, this issue can be uh, further, um, I mean, given more visibility and be further addressed. I don't know if this responds to the question, but if they wish to elaborate further. Uh, yeah, we, we, they are here online. If yes. you would like to have a follow-up, uh, Vela P or Fatima, we can have a follow-up question. I think there's one. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rola, for your presentation. And thank you, Sarah, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I think the response is satisfactory on my side uh, in terms of the inclusion aspect. I, I was just curious about the research in itself in terms of how it approaches the, the climate displaced persons, given that we we know that we, we cannot see them as a homogeneous group. And oftentimes, um, uh, these populations uh, are always uh, inclusive of, uh, uh, you know, various uh, uh, people, especially persons with disabilities, uh, indigenous groups, and others who oftentimes are, are left out of the initial analysis. So I was just curious about whether the, the, the papers or the synthesis reports that are being made are deliberate around those aspects. Thank you, Rola. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No, you're, you're perfectly right. I mean, uh, they are different components, they're not homogeneous. And uh, there is, uh, uh, I mean, of course, there are additional barriers that uh, certain groups of population among the, the climate displaced population are, are facing. And, uh, and, and, and that's why it's important, maybe just getting back to uh, the, uh, before I, I started to, to, to this, I think this, uh, this is important because there's, uh, I mean, uh, it's not an exhaustive list, of course, but there's groups of People in general uh, are facing are facing specific challenges, and when it comes to climate displacement, they are facing even more challenges because several uh, groups of uh, part of these groups uh, are subject, of course, to to intersectional forms of discrimination. So, so this. This is why we are adding vulnerabilities to vulnerabilities, no? Uh, and of, uh, and when, when it's difficult to ensure the right to education, for instance, to, 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 to people who are uh, to, to, um, in, um, disabled, for instance, or, or people uh, who are, um, who have, um, uh, uh, um, who are migrants, who have other backgrounds, it's even more difficult. It's even difficult because there are additional needs that need to be, uh, to be addressed. So this becomes, I would say, even more complex because precisely of uh, the multiple uh, kind of uh, uh, discrimination and inequalities. So you're perfectly right. And yes, this, the, the, the research uh, try to have to, 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 to focus on this angle uh, precisely. Uh, and uh, um, 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 through, uh, I mean, it, it was very difficult because, uh, I mean, as I was mentioning, um, uh, we are facing uh, difficulties in getting data uh, and, uh, and this is actually a major, sorry. Okay, sorry. This is uh, uh, this is sorry a, a, a major um, 
one of the major difficulties uh, as well. But this is important, and we have to to, to and we have to, uh, to 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 address this issue. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rola. And now I see Fatima's uh, have follow up question. Fatima. Great, Sara, thank you so much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Sara, thank you so much for organizing this. And Rola, what a terrific presentation. And thank you for really helping us strategically connect the dots around how climate is so critical, um, both in future planning, but in today's efforts as well for populations all around the world. And I really appreciated your point that you made that it's not just around displacement or migration um, or just vulnerable groups. In fact, it's really going to be everybody that gets impacted in so many different ways. And then, of course, heightened by those who are most vulnerable. So I think that point is just incredibly important. And thank you for really helping us better understand the critical work UNESCO is doing in partnership with so many others as part of Education 2030. I wanted to actually ask you from where you're sitting at UNESCO, focusing and leading on so many of these initiatives, how do you feel about the... Is there sufficient policy understanding and attention at global levels around within the climate conversations, particularly around education? Because um, from where I sit, I don't tend to hear as much on the education pieces. You tend to hear much more around adaptation, mitigation, around finance issues, technology, public health, etc. Um, do you think there's sufficient focus and attention to the very issues that you are working on and presenting? Here and if so, we'd love to hear more about that. And if not, what can other stakeholders, like um, those of us here at Harvard Center for International Development and others, do to raise more awareness um, and to use our voices to make some of these policy connections within the climate space to emphasize the critical education pieces that you raised? Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. You're perfectly right. I, I mean, no, this is an incredibly interesting question. Because I mean, and I would be very direct, no? <laughs> and I, I think we don't have time to, but I, I will be very direct. And no, I, I think that definitely uh, the problem is that education is not prioritized in this discourse, not at all. And when it is, it's, it, it's, um, uh, it's not, uh, I mean, it's not about mitigating, it's, it's more about adaptation, no? So it's about education. Uh, that um, needs to ensure, I mean, it's about uh, education for sustainable development, for instance, education to, that uh, through which we try to mitigate the impact of climate change, but the, the opposite way is not sufficiently addressed. I mean, the consequences of those who are already affected by climate change, this is not, uh, a priority, and there is really little um, literature on 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 this. Uh, so we need to we need to develop the arguments. We need to make the case, and of course, yes, if partners, if other partners, if can can try to at least um, raise awareness or highlight this these issues, uh, communicate around because this is important, and the phenomenon we, we know that. It's growing anyway. We, it's not an isolated. No, it's it's becoming general. And as you said, uh, every I mean, uh, almost everyone will be uh, at some point affected. So this is an important. Uh, of course, we we have to to work towards ensuring that this will not happen. But when it happens we need to address the consequences, and we need to adapt. We need to 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 make sure that policymakers that countries have um, their um, education national policies and systems well prepared no they have to anticipate they have to anticipate the consequences of of of, of the problem so this needs to be better known this needs to be to be to be prioritized in the public discourse so i think we need yes to to work together to, I mean, I think this research, this all this research, it, it's a good way also to, to advocate for it, to show that there are clear impacts and there is need for engagement. 
and there is need for strong engagement with concrete measures to be taken. To be taken at national level, at regional level, because this is uh, an important, uh, uh, this is uh, important that countries work together and also uh, exchange on that, but also at international level. So I, I don't know if I, if, I, if I responded to your question, but I think we need to, to join really hands and really work on this to make it more visible. This is what is needed actually to make it more visible. No, thanks, Rob. I'll just quickly respond. I really appreciate that. And I think what you're really stressing around the visibility and the prioritization um, as we think about the road to COP later this year mm -hmm. um, and all the steps that so many of us, because we're in these intersectional spaces on the climate conversation, I think it's a really uh, great moment to remind ourselves of, of how little this, this um, conversation is being prioritized at the global levels on the climate conversations and ways that we can really help make and strengthen those connections and linkages will be really important. So I just really appreciate that you're bringing such visibility um, to this conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Rona. I think we're coming to a close to our webinar today. And I would like to share that I hope this inspires more research towards action, towards also sharing a lot of the information that you shared on the platforms we have here. So it's a great opportunity to getting the role started um, now. Um, and also, um, it, we, we could continue also working together for a more equitable and sustainable future for all. So this is like the beginning, the fruit, and then we hope to see uh, this is the seed and we hope to see the fruit uh, in the coming uh, months. Uh, thank you very much once again. And thank you very much for joining us very late in Paris today. Thank you very much. Really, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank Bye. you, Rola. Thank, thank you. you. Thank so you much. all. Thank you.